A disgruntled American comedian once said that all the funny man had to show for his years of work was the echo of forgotten laughter. Well, it's no bad thing to have ringing in your ears, which is why tonight I'm going to concentrate on reviving some of the laughter that's been on this show in recent times. The guest list is a catalogue of some of the world's funniest men, and what's more, people who found various ways of making us laugh. Coming at them, Tommy Cooper, Bob Hope, John Cleese, Billy Connolly, Rowan Atkinson, Frankie Howard, Spike Milligan, Harry Seacombe, Dave Allen, Ken Dodd, Jim Davison, Cannon and Ball, and others too numerous to mention. First off, here's one of the best comedians in the business, at present at the peak of his craft. He's Jimmy Tarbuck, and in the words of his great hero, Max Miller, now here's a funny thing. There's an Arab goes to the dentist, the dentist said, it's all right, you don't need nothing done. He said, drill anyway, I feel lucky. <laughs> Not yet! Not yet! Please! There is more. It's not often I get the chance. I only do auditions anyway. The other one I heard was the fellow ranked up an agency. One of those, you know, ladies' agencies for a hostess. He said, have you got a bird, he said, about six foot ten, who weighs about six and a half stone? The fellow said, what? He said, yeah. He said, great big lanky one. Uh, he gets this great big thin woman and she comes around. She's a bit not bad, but tall. He said to her, right, he said, take your clothes off and get on all fours in front of the fire. So she said, all right. So she's on all fours. He went, here, boy. And a great big Great Dane comes in. She said, what the hell's going on? He said, just a moment. He looks at the dog. He says, there. That's what you'll look like if you don't eat your kenami. watching this tonight, he'll have a, what's he saying? I'm fascinated by what you say about the telepathy with animals, and it does... You have it? I have it uh, more with humans than with animals, but I can... I speak to them, but I didn't realize it was through telepathy. Yes. Have you got yeah, a, any exist. telepathic powers, Bill? Yeah, I have. <laughs> 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 But the exact moment it happened, my daughter woke up screaming in Scotland. <laughs> yes, that was what I was actually going to talk about. Like Alex, he was great. <laughs> I haven't made any jokes about him, but he was a bloke. Alex. Well, he's the sort of caricature of people. When we used to hang around shops when you were a kid, waiting to get in the mischief and that, and looking at, whistling at the girls. And uh, he, was, he was older than us. We was about 13, and he was about 30. <laughs> Oh, and he used to hang round with us and wear the same clothes and all that, and he thought it would be a bit of a check of lad, all right, booties? <laughs> he used to call people boydies. And I say, all right, girlies and boydies. Like, all right, boydies? We were walking through an alley once, and there was this Alex. And I was like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> one of them, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he used to go fishing. Now, he used to belong to a place called Woolwich and Dartford Angling Society, which never had any waters. <laughs> So I used to get up in the morning to crack the dawn, get on his coach, drive for miles, cast in, catch one and come back, you see. And every Saturday night we used to see him walking up the road, Fargen Road, and he had this big box on his back. Ooh, boy, boy, it is. <laughs> like a swarm of wasps and flies around him where he ain't throwing his maggots away. <laughs> and we used to say to him, Call the big Alex, he always just say exactly the same thing. Gospel truth. Not much. Cut the roach, cut the tench, cut the pipe, cut the bream, cut the bread, cut the... <laughs> uh, every night, hello, Alex, call the big this week. Oh, not much. <laughs> Cut the roach, cut the tent, cut the pike. <laughs> and we said, you know what, them pike are terrible. You pulled it up. He said, you know what? He said, I've seen a pike. Jump up, <laughs> jump up the bank and bite the bark off a tree. <laughs> so and that, now another couple of years have passed. And I haven't seen this, Alex, and I took up carp fishing. And I caught a big bruiser one day. It was a bruiser, about 21 and a half pound it was. It was a record in the lake at the time. It was about, I don't know, about 20 odd. And I put it in the little net thing. In the morning, I woke up, and who's fishing next to me? Alex, isn't it? I couldn't believe it. I was so I said, Go on, living, Alex. He went, Not much. Got the roots, got the tents, got the I said, You want to go carp fishing? <laughs> Too risky. Right? <laughs> I said, Look at that. And he packed up and buggered off. Oh, I haven't seen it <laughs> Fly, where's the fly? Oh. <laughs> oh, Look at the state of this. That's right. <laughs> Those early days, there was, uh, there was a character, I think you probably know, he's a, he's a great mate of mine still called Nobby Carr in Manchester. Oh, you met Nobby. You know yeah. Nobby. Yeah. And um, he's, he's, he's one of the, the greatest unpaid and unsung heroes of all time, because he's genuinely, I think, apart 
from Chick Murray and him are my two most admired raconteurs and, and funny people that can make an, an ordinary event into an hilarious happening. And I was talking to him a couple of months back and he said he was in Piccadilly Gardens. Now we've got Yates's Wine Lodge just across the gardens. And uh, Yates's Wine Lodge is where all the light ale cavaliers go in for an afternoon supping and they get Australian all in for something like 30p and get out of the brain in two and a half minutes. The fastest road out of Manchester, they used to call it. And um, he was in Piccadilly Gardens once from one of the Yates's Wine Lodge light ale fusiliers staggered out. And Nobby was looking for a job and he sat there with his rings on and the big gold thing because nobody has to be seen to be really I cannot describe him and he sat there reading the paper the situation is vacant and this character came up to him and with saying very few words went through this entire pantomime he said to Nobby on the park bench like hello Nobby uh, looking for a job are you Nobby said aye, aye. looking for a job fella said no never mind all that he said never mind giving it all that he said and that he said Go down Eight Town Street, he said, the Labour Exchange, give it that. He said, if you give it that, you get that or that in there, he says. You get that or that in there, he says, you can go down there, he says, you can give it that, he said. That and plenty of that as well, he says. He says, because I'll tell you what, Nobby, he says, if you don't give it that, he says, you get none of that and none of that, he says. So what do you do? He says, you go in Woolies, you're giving it that. He says, you're giving it that. He says, and then you get that. He says, and you get ten months or something like that. <laughs> I was thinking of words. I'm not a, a visual man, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm always thinking of words not only in the, in, uh, on the show, but, you know, here and now, like, I love thinking of people's names backwards. And of course, you're nosy crap, you know. I'm nosy crap. <laughs> You have, of course, and we're going to make a virtue of this in the two room, because one of my favourite bits of it is the mispronunciation. Thing. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Do you want a bit of that? I would like to give you a bit of that. I'd like, like to give you a bit of that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, good evening. Uh, last year, I spoke to you appealing for help for those who, like myself, have trouble with worms. They can't <laughs> pronounce their worms properly. Now, I am the secretary for the Loyal Society for the Relief of Sufferers from Pispronunciation. <laughs> Now, the reason I'm once more squeaking to you tonight is that many people last time couldn't understand what I was spraying. <laughs> so I'm back again on your little queens to strain it and make it all queer. <laughs> it's a terrible thong to be ting-tied. It's even worse when your weirds get all mucked up and come out in wakka say that you dick not what you're thunging you be. <laughs> like I did just say, there ain't crutch much nurse. I mean, it can be cured by careful draining at special draining stools, which the society has fed up all over the Twittish Isles. And for the really dicky felt cases, we have a we have a three year bash course on the Isle of Fright. <laughs> but the disease is spreading. It affects people from all who are walks of loaf, uh, <laughs> members of the swivel service, lawyers, silly sodders, <laughs> commercial dribblers, cop sheepers, and wackery perkins, <laughs> especially on the nightshirt, and famous piddlyticians like Widley Hamilton. Not forgetting, of course, Pinock Owl. <laughs> Stars of Screege and Stain like Black Mygraves, Frantic Hard, and Peculiar Clark. <laughs> And, of course, rude old Noriev, the ballet dangler. <laughs> and I know that, that, that you're interested in mime, and that used to be part of your act, yes, didn't it? Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. Can, you, can you demonstrate um, for some... There's probably a lot of people, actually, who know you only as a television comic who won't have seen that before, the kind of particular mimes that you used to do. Any favourites? Yes. Uh, oh, as I said, I'd like to show you this because this is a... Uh, you don't mind me showing this? No. Thing, because I belong to the Magic Circle. Yes. And uh, I belong to the Inner Magic Circle, really. Hmm. And also the Secret Six. The, the Secret Six. Yeah. I don't even know the other five. You know? <laughs> uh, this may not be right, but I'd like to show you this because this was given me by the President of the Magic Circle. <coughs> because it's special wood. Special wood? Yeah, special wood. And it costs about 500 pounds. There's not another one in the world like this. Very special. Special wood. I'm, it's, it's, I'm very pleased with it. Look at the grain that wood. <laughs> very nice. I like you know uh, what I call the Simple Simon and the Feather. Simple Simon. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
making people laugh. I've seen this advert I've seen this advertisement somewhere where it said uh, Arm <laughs> Arnold Ramsbottom, plumber and artificial leg maker. So I just that tickled artificial me. Artificial leg maker. <laughs> it was the, the two things. Plumber. And so I call myself Professor Yaffel Chocobutti, operatic tenor and sausage nutter. <laughs> And I used to go around uh, telling gags and uh, clubs. Then I graduated to Masonics. Are you what? Are you in the... Uh... No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they do? Is that the secret? Oh, yes. Didn't you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> The, Mr. Fisher, the producer, yeah. Mr. Fisher, Mr. Mr. my Fisher. producer. Yes, we are in. He took me last week to join. We are now. We know a secret that nobody in the whole world knows about. Do the Gladys. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the Oddfellas, you see. The Oddfellas. <laughs> and he took me to the Oddfellas Temple. He said, "On the way, Doddy. On the way." He said, "If anybody stops us on the way, swallow this." I said, "What is it?" He said, "An enamel bucket." <laughs> We got to the lodge, we gave the secret knock thrice. What was it for? Anyway, somebody opened the door in the big door and chucked a midget out. Yeah. <laughs> a big fellow opened the door with a long nose. He lost his key. <laughs> he his One big tall ginger headed fellow, he had the scrolls. He said, I'm sorry, lads, I'll have to go home. I've got the scrolls. <laughs> sorry. What, what, did, what did I ask you? Yeah. I have no idea. Uh, well, um, I oh, what? we started off doing Masonics. Masonics, Masonics. 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 And then Sunday concerts, and uh, Sunday concerts, and then uh, I, then I met this a this fellow, this agent. Oh, I was introduced to a man called Dave For David Forrester in uh, Liverpool uh, 25 years ago, and uh, we, we had tea at the Adelphi Hotel. We had tea and cakes, and the bill came to one and nine, and he let me pay. <laughs> so I thought, well, he looks, if he looks after his money like that, it'll be all right for me. So he came to see me working. I was playing just an odd week in, at Wigan Hippodrome, and it was in a strip show, you know, one of these nude shows. And it's very difficult telling gags with just your socks on. <laughs> What about the, what stage did the hair? You know, you do the hair. What did what? How, I'm a very, I'm a very nervous. You know, I get stage fright very easily. And then in the old, I mean, the first days, I had to have some. I used to go. Oh, 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 oh. And one night, it was in Norwich at the Carlton. I was doing this, and it actually stood on it like this. Is it good? <laughs> So I used to say, how's that message? By Joe. P-A-L, puts hers on lads. <laughs> P-L-J, puts lumps on Judy's. Oh my God. <laughs> and the hair and the, the sort of thing. These people say, how did your fingers get like that? Well, actually, I had them trapped in a till. <laughs> I joined the crazy gang in one show, and Jimmy Nervo and his wife are my daughter's godmother and godfather. Really? So you mentioned Eddie Gray there. Was he the funniest of the lot off? Not the funniest of the lot, he was the funniest man in the world. Was he? Not only was he a funny man, he had a sense of humour that was entirely different to anybody I ever met. He had this straight face, he looked so serious, never been mistaken for a comedian, either he'd be uh, a doctor or a solicitor, and you, you never knew how you were going to get involved with Eddie. <laughs> and he would do a gag that would last three or four days. <laughs> now, anyway, Eddie came to me, we were in a show together. Now. For 30 odd years, he called me nothing else but governor. It was always Gov, and I always called him genius. I, I don't suppose I ever called him Eddie, and he never called me Tom. It was always, how are you, genius? All right, Gov. So he came in one day, we were at Eastbourne doing a show, and he said, Gov, will you do a gag with me? I said, yeah, what do you want? He said, I want you to run on and say, what do you have for breakfast this morning? And I say, had it. And you say, finnan? I say, no, a ficken. <laughs> and I said, will you leave me alone? Go away! <laughs> you jugglers who want to be comics. He said, no, Gov, it'll be a pretty good laugh. So I said, no, no, please. I thought, I'll do it. Try that. He said, could you come down early tomorrow before the curtain goes up? I'd like to rehearse it on the stage. So I said, mm -hmm. So I got on the stage, he said, no, it's better if you come on from the other side. I'll come on from the other side, stand for all this. Mm -hmm. So just before he goes on, he said, Gov, 
Will you do it? I said, of course <laughs> I'll do it. He said, better run it through for luck. Mm. All right. What do you have for breakfast this morning? Had it. Finnan? No, Ficken. Oh, marvellous. Your timing is. <laughs> so the queue came and I ran on. What do you have for breakfast this morning? He said, cornflakes. <laughs> That took him three days, you see, so I thought, I've got to get my own back. <laughs> so I'm looking at the paper and it says, Nadler, are you depressed? Are you contemplating suicide? If so, ring the Good Samaritans, Eastbourne, double four, double four. That's it. <laughs> so I write the note, Mr. Gray, will you kindly ring Eastbourne, double four, double four, <laughs> at once? I put the rap. So Eddie walks in my room, I had the phone on, she says, Gov, can I use the phone? I said, yeah. <laughs> so he obviously dialed double four, double four, and the voice must have said, this is the Good Samaritans. And then he said, oh yeah, what sort of show is it? <laughs> so after about 10 minutes, I've convinced him what it is. So he just got up and said, thank you very much, Governor. And walked out. Well, about two minutes later, tap, tap on my door. Can I come in? Come in. Tap, tap, tap. Can I come in? Come in. Tap, tap, tap. Can I come in? So I go to the door and open it. There is Eddie Gray, stark naked. He's got nothing on except his top hat, his massage, his shoes and socks. And he said, I've been sent by the Good Samaritans to sit with you. <laughs> I have been away, you know. Oh, well, it doesn't show. Nobody will know. I've been to Africa. Africa? Yeah. I bet you didn't go in that coat. <laughs> no, I went in an aeroplane. <laughs> I'll kick his legs from underneath him. <laughs> what were you doing in Africa? I was the colonial secretary. That's what caused all the trouble, was it? Yeah. No, I was very popular there. Well, you would be, of course, yes. Yeah. They yeah. gave me a present. Oh, that's nice. Mm. What did they give you? Two man-eating lions. <laughs> did they give you a few yards start as well? <laughs> I brought them home with me. Oh, well, of course you would, yes. Mm. Where do you keep the lions, then? In the box. <laughs> Are they in there now? Yeah. <laughs> I thought I heard a rustling. Ah, <laughs> uh, go and get two coffees. <laughs> Are you telling him about the lions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's got yeah. two lions in there. How much are they? I mean... <laughs> He doesn't want to sell them. They're a sentimental gift from the African people. I've been to Nyasa land as well. Well, they're nice people, the Nyasas. Mm. <laughs> I bet they gave you something, eh? Yeah. Yes. What did they give you? A giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> Dial 999. <laughs> I'll keep him talking. So, are you telling him about the giraffe? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, somebody must be looking for him. <laughs> it's in the bloody he's, 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 he's got a giraffe. Yeah. Is it black or white? I don't know. What colour's the giraffe? The copy, aren't they? <laughs> Your mother would have been better off with a set of spoons, you know. I've been to India as well. Oh, you have been everywhere. Yeah. Well, they'd give you something. Mrs. Yeah. Gandhi, I bet she... Uh, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Mm. What did she give you? An elephant. <laughs> I've an idea, but I don't like to ask her. <laughs> Is it a male or female? No, an elephant. <laughs> no, no, you see, there's a male elephant and there's a female elephant. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't suppose it matters to you whether it's a male or female. It wouldn't uh, uh, matter to anybody only another elephant. <laughs> I'll stop you going to those youth clubs. I brought it home with well, me. Well, of course, yeah. yes, yes. Where do you keep the elephant? In the box. Don't be silly, you couldn't get an elephant in there. <laughs> no, it's stupid of me. I got carried away there. You couldn't get an elephant in there, there's no room. He could ask the... Does he have to move over a bit? 
and frighten the dumb lions. <laughs> no, I keep the elephant in a cage. Of course. Oh, yeah. Sensible. Yeah. He keeps the elephant in a cage. Yeah. Where do you keep the cage? In, in the, the box. box. Pound the expression, I'll show you my range. Right. <laughs> what did it go from? <laughs> to work. Right, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Um, anger. Anger. Listen, you'll love this. I'll put the chair back now. Oh, you swine! <laughs> Where's the camera? Put it on that camera there, that's anger. Oh, you swine! I won't do it! You I won't do it! No, no, that's sorry, that's not anger, that's tragedy. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's meant to be anger. Come on, I'll get you, you sw Come on, come on. That's it, you see. You don't frighten me for a second. That's anger. What else? Joy. 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 What, well, mother? Was Keep that camera on, will you? <laughs> Hello. Isn't it a lovely day? <laughs> Isn't the news beautiful? Recession and everything. <laughs> Lovely day. And Christmas is on us. Crampy time. Ah, uh, yeah. What else? Humility. <laughs> Humility. 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 The prize undone. Shut your face. <laughs> Dallas, for instance, is back with us, and I know it's a, it's a, it's an abiding passion with you, is it? Is it not? Well, I love all of those. You, you see, I began with Mrs. Dale Stark. You did. <laughs> And I adored life in Parkwood Hill, those dear Dales. It was simply lovely. Mrs. Dales, Dr. Dale, Mrs. Dales' mother, Mrs. Freeman, with her cat, Captain. And I particularly liked Mrs. Dales' very, very smart sister called Sally. Yes. And Sally ran a hat shop. I think it was called Stephanie. And because she was, she always came in saying, hello, darlings. And because she was so smart and chic, they always referred to her not as Sally, but as Sally. <laughs> I say, here comes Sally. Well, now, in the early days of Mrs. Dale's diary, Mrs. Dale used to get a kiss once every two months. <laughs> There'd be a bit of dialogue that dear Dr. Dale would say, I say, Mary, you're looking pretty spiffing today. <laughs> and Mary would say, oh, Jim, don't be so ridiculous. <laughs> And then, then there was a sort of scuffling sound <laughs> on the hearth rug, and then that harp twang. So one assumed that Mrs. Dale had had a lovely kiss, but it always, <laughs> as it took place in the afternoon and downstairs, it was all right. If you were the <laughs> and then, by a natural process, one went on to Dallas. Well, now, what a marvelous treat that is. <laughs> you like that, you? Oh, the treat of the year. <laughs> I do adore it. Almost every episode begins when they're having breakfast on that windswept sort of patio. <laughs> And they all come out, and there's a tornado there, and the awnings are all flapping, and those bushes are being blown backwards and forwards, and all their hair gets blown over there, so they have to pick out pieces of hair to see each other, with looks of loathing. Anyhow, they all come out, and before very long, one of the girls takes off her dressing gown, and lo and behold, she's in a swimsuit. And she steps into that pool and floats chest up a <laughs> And all the men sort of gaze at her with terrible looks. Well, then old Sue Ellen comes up, <laughs> comes blaring out and sits down at her breakfast. And I always suspect her of pouring gin over her cornflakes. <laughs> She gets more and more bleary. Does she see? With every mouth. Not either the great lip actors to Oh, awful. <laughs> well, then they all get into cars and fly off into the Dallas in order to be unfaithful to each other. <laughs> I love my friends, and they love me. We're just as close as we can be. And just because we really care, whatever we get. We share. I got it from Agnes. She got it from Jim. We all agree it must have been Louise who gave it to him. And she got it from Harry, who got it from Marie. And everybody knows that Marie 
got it from me. <laughs> Giles got it from Daphne. She got it from Joan. She picked it up in Ireland, a kiss in the Blarney Stone. Pierre gave it to Sheila, who must have brought it there. He got it from Francois and Jacques. Aha, lucky Pierre. <laughs> Max got it from Edith, who gets it every spring. She got it from her daddy, who just gives her everything. She then gave it to Daniel, whose spaniel has it now. Our dentist even got it, and we're still wondering how. <laughs> I got it from Agnes, or maybe it was Sue, or Millie, or Billy, or Jilly, or Willie, or doesn't matter who. It might have been at the pub, or at the club, or in the loo, and if you will be my friend, then I might. Mind you, I said might. Give it to you. <laughs> the best stopping show, oh, I don't know, let me see about the... Uh fellow playing, and he came to this hole-in-one. He said, I've never had a hole-in-one. If I could get a hole-in-one, I'd give anything in the world. And this little genie jumped up on his shoulder, said, anything? He said, anything. The genie said, would you give uh, five years of your sex life? He said, yeah, I think I would. And he uh, knocked this ball. It wasn't too good, but it hit a rock, went up and fell in the hole. He said, a hole-in-one. Isn't that great? He walked the next hole. It's a par five. He said, I've never had a birdie in this hole. If I could get a birdie in this hole, I'd give anything in the world. And this little genie jumped up on his shoulder, said, anything, said anything. Would you give 10 years of your sex life? He said, 10 years? Well, yes, I would. He said, we'll play. And he hit three pretty good shots. And his fourth shot wasn't too good, but he hit a bench, went up and rolled in the cup. He said, how do you like that? A hole-in-one and a birdie the same day. This is the greatest day of my golfing career. And the little birdie jumped in his shoulder, said, I didn't get your name. And he said, Father O'Toole. <laughs> Religion. Hmm. I mean, you were brought up in a religious manner. I was. You? I was brought up. Uh, I was. I went to school when I was three and a half years. And that's what I hate about parents. When I when I took my children to school, I told them, "You're going to school. That's it. You're going, and I will take you there." My my parents gave me the impression that I was going to school for one day. They, they used to say, "One day you'll go to school," and I thought that was it. One day. <laughs> but I I arrived and and I mean it was really the Gestapo in drag. The nuns, I'm not joking you. Those, those glasses, looking, and all the blue veins, and I mean, all the whole kind of thing. And, uh, and I, I, the first day, my mother took me to school the first day and left me there. And I was left with two, two nuns, two young sisters who were supposed to be looking after me. I didn't want to stay there. And they, they kept on giving me sheets of paper and a pencil. And they'd say, draw something. I go, nah! And they give me another piece of paper. And, go, nah! and this went on, and then I got home. And then I went, I was, my mother said, uh, the next day, go to school. And I said, but I've only had, I've had my schooling. It was yesterday. She said, no, no, you've got to go today as well. So I went there and I went into the school and I came back. And it was the first time I'd ever played hooky or mitched, as we call it in Ireland. And I went straight back home. And my mother said, why aren't you at school? And I said, there's no school today. And I sat there and I was quite happy. And the, the, there was a knock on the door. It was like the KGB. And, the, and there's two of them. Standing there, we've come to take your son. <laughs> and my mother gave me away. She said, all right, take him. Is that a hearing aid, Mike, the thing in that ear? No, no. <laughs> it's that little, that the plastic thing that they can't see that I can see. No, you can't see. I go. No, I'm kidding. He doesn't have it. Show them. Show them. <laughs> I make a joke. I like to fool around. I know that the man dresses differently late at night. I know that. How do you I, know that? I know, I've seen you with wedgies, with clear plastic heels, with goldfish in them. <laughs> yes, I've seen you with them. I know. And that's the only thing I'll talk about on the air. <laughs> Who was I with when you saw me? A, a boy called Rouse. Never mind. <laughs> this man was a sergeant major. Formidable. I mean, just as he portrays a formidable man. And we were all frightened to death, you see. But luckily, I got... I got uh, on tour with a show, so I missed it, really. And I went to Hong Kong with a review. And when I came back, I said to Stanley Baxter, what happened to all that discipline stuff with that Sergeant Major? I mean, yes, you might well ask. Hmm, well, apparently he was caught with his fingers in the till. They used to have the costumes done by Chinese tailors, and apparently he was saying, well, put down 500 and we split the difference, you see. And keeping the lolly, you see. And so there was an inquiry and a court-martial. And rather than face this court-martial, 
he uh, took prussic acid. And so they... <laughs> yeah, you see. So they... Uh, he said we got him to the military hospital, but he died before the arrival. And so the O.C., Major Woodings, lined them up in the, on the parade ground and said, Now, look here. Sergeant Major's killed himself. The man's more blood trouble dead than he was alive. We've got to, <laughs> now, now we've got, to, we've got to bury him. So all over, six foot, stand forward for Paul Barry. And everyone in the ranks all sort of went down a bit. Because <laughs> no one wanted to carry this coffin, you know. It was quite understandable, really. I mean, they were artists, you see. And so <laughs> he, he, went down, he went down the line. And as he came to Stanley back, to Stanley was shrinking visibly, you see. And he said, all right, you can go. You can be a pallbearer. And Baxter said, I'm Church, uh, Church of Scotland. <laughs> And the old man said, oh, I see, well, sorry, I of course. <laughs> and went on down the line, and then the penny dropped, he turned back and said, just a minute! What are you talking about, you berry people, don't you? Come on, out! <laughs> he was caught, and they caught about half a dozen others, you see, and they had to go with this coffin on their shoulders, and of course it was that particular period when the monsoon simply fell down, and it was pouring, and they got to this cemetery, or whatever it was, and military place, you see, and there was a padre with these cassock flapping and all the, the rain just simply pouring down, you see. And he was standing there with all this, um, man is born a woman and his life is brief and full of misery. We come out of the corner and he's cut down at the corner and there is no hope. And then he saw this flag because they put a Union Jack on the, on the coffin and he said, get the flag off! Get that flag off! It's an ignominious death. Don't give battle honours with ignominious, because if you kill yourself, it's ignominious, you see. So they said, oh dear, and they're all too deep. <laughs> Try to get down and get the flag off, you see. And they were all standing there, very limp, you know. So, oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> and then there was supposed to be someone saying, right file, right turn, left file, left, you see, to march off. And there was no one to say right file, left turn, because he was in this... <laughs> and hoping whole thing fell about in the most appalling confusion. It was terrible confusion with this vicar saying, just go, just go. <laughs> and the Woodings, the commanding officer, was standing there, they were wonderfully moving, very moving, <laughs> very moving, you see. He was standing there saluting. And a packard arrived, an enormous packard with a Chinese chauffeur holding an umbrella. And a lady got out and stood by the graveside with all of us. We were all looking and thinking, what's she doing, you know? So, this is there, is he in that box? Oh, my God, it's so terrible. And Wooding said, oh, madam, uh, who, who are you? And she said, I'm married to, I was married, I was wife. <laughs> and he'd secretly married in Singapore, and she was deposited in this hotel in Singapore. And so Wooding said, well, my dear, you must be very distressed. She said, yeah, I am very distressed. I had no idea this was going to happen. He said, well, I see. Well, you dismiss your chauffeur and come with me in my Jeep, and I will look after you, don't worry about a thing. And she he was ensconced in his, his room, you see. Oh. He didn't like to go in to get orders, you know, to where you were supposed to go. And she was sitting there in the kimono with a coffee. And I thought, wow, it didn't take her long to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. I think that's the longest reply to any question. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of reserve were you? I only have played walk on parts in battle. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're meeting uh, Montgomery. Oh, you met? No, I did indeed. Did you? Yes. In uh, what kind of circumstances? <laughs> oh, it's rather peculiar. Uh, <laughs> he was. Uh, he came to. Uh, we were Eighth Army, the First Army. Mm. We uh, we were made Eighth Army, and he came to introduce us to the Eighth Army, and he drove in, into our regiment in, uh, in order, sort of square, open square. <clears throat> there is such a thing as open square. No? We, we had an open square. <laughs> a funny regiment, and he he was in this. Uh, Open car. He stood there with a flag missing. Get the one, wink, wink, get the one, he said. So I pushed willy nilly right underneath him. Right, honestly, just there, there's the microphone. Hello, Mike. There, he's just up there. <laughs> and uh, I had my hair, it was very long. I, I went to get an Italian haircut. You see, we, we knew we were going to get it with Italy sometime, so I thought <laughs> I'm not going to risk my barnet to the old regimental barber. I went looking to, to where we were going to go to. So I pushed it all up underneath my, my berry. And I had boils. We all had boils. Could be on compo rations. You know what it was? Boy, boy! Two pickles. And I. <laughs> well, I had a boil of a big one. And I. <laughs> I, <laughs> I had these glasses, you know, these steel rim glasses, which have been broken about 14 times, and I've been repaired with electricious tape, this black stuff. So. They all like this. They all nurgled on my face like that. 
So he said, take your bearings off. I want to see what your chaps look like. So I got my hat off. And everything, my hat, my hat. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's talking. Now you chaps have left the First Army and a grand job. Are you leaving the First Army now? And you're coming to us in the eighth <laughs> I look intelligent, nodding all the time. <laughs> and he kept, every time he was talking, he kept coming back to me. <laughs> and, and at one period, there was, a, there was a sort of hiatus, and I felt imperiled. And I thought, well, I'd better fill it with something. So I said, we're with you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> On speaking on behalf of the whole First Army, he said, yes. <laughs> I think true stories are funnier than when you make them up. I don't like dirty stories, but this is, this is a true story. It involves from the waist downwards, but it's a true story. Um, a friend of mine, uh, who should remain nameless, primarily because he wasn't baptised. And he... <laughs> uh, he, he was, this is a true story. Please believe me, this is true. He, uh, got, a t he got dysentery, uh, uh, right? <laughs> Tell me one of those stories. And... Uh, Open a window. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> he got this and really thought it, it, things were getting a bit bad, and people in the office were sort of spreading around, keeping away. So sorry. <laughs> and uh, they suggested he went home early. So it was t he had to walk to Waterloo. It was about 25 minutes before the rush hour started. And he started a walk, a walk thing, and it was really had very bad. And he, uh, he had an, on the way to the station, he had a terrible accident, you know. And uh, he thought. <laughs> And uh, he, he, he thought, I can't go on like this. But, 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 uh, uh, so he saw a supermarket and he rushed in and he sort of walked around and said, look, uh, can you have a, can I have um?" <laughs> he said, he keeps, and I said, I've got a disease of the legs. So I can't, you know, they said, um, can you give me a pair of underpants and a pair of trousers, medium size? He said, well, wait, wait. He said, no, I've just got to park the car. So he kept moving around outside. He looked through and said, oh, got him right. So he came in and got this plastic bag. And uh, gave me any part with the, with, the, with the trousers and things in it, rushed up with the train, and by then it was, it was rush hour. And he thought, my God, I can't go in a compartment, he was just reeking by now, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he thought, ah, the loo, the car seat. So he got into the car seat, locked the door, like this, and waited for the train to start, and then he took these trousers off, and he's, <laughs> and he's under fence, and he threw them out the window. <laughs> right? The pants off the back. And then he opened the plastic bag, and it was a lady's pink cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a pre story. It happened to, I'll tell the man who did it happened to Jack Hobbs. Yes, get to Jack Hobbs in the phone, but asking did it happen. This Jack is not the end of it, though. Oh. One of the end of it? Just, just, just the, Jack Hobbs, the publisher. The publisher. Oh, not the creator. No, no, not the creator, no, no. <laughs> it couldn't happen to him, only on those perverse circumstances. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Underground. Yes. Well, anybody travelling mm. underground. Anyhow, he, he's, he's going to get off the train. They say, well, train the country after the station, take one of the things. So he's wearing a Toby hat, a jacket, collar and tie, and naked from the waist downwards with the pink lady's cardigan. So in desperation, he pulled his legs. <laughs> he pulled his leg. Suddenly <laughs> 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 so realised where the neck was, all his wedding tackle was hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> just coming up the platform, so he thought, he, that's the English at the best, and so he took his chubby hat off, and he tucked the, tucked the, he tucked the brim all the... <laughs> oh dear. This is not a lie, please, this is not a lie, don't make this up, this is a true story. <laughs> Was, was your... Uh, let, let's go back to those early days of yours, because uh, a fellow idiot, I, I assume, with you in those days, is somebody who sadly died since last yeah, week we met, and that's Peter Sellers. Yeah, a lovely man. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you remember him? He said to me, about 12 years ago, I've chosen the music for my funeral. Oh, yes. So I said, oh, yeah, don't be silly, of course you haven't. 
don't talk like that. You'll see, you'll see me out. You're five years younger than I am. And he said, no, really, I have. And I thought, oh, well, so I went along with it. And I said, well, uh, what have you chosen? And he said, in the mood. <laughs> and I said, but you hate in the mood. He said, not that terrible recording. <laughs> and he said, that's the one. I said, you're, you're a nut. He said, well, can you... He started giggling, you see. He said, can you imagine? They're all going to be sitting there, including you, probably. And the coffin will be committed. And as it goes away, you'll get... <laughs> and I thought he was joking. They changed the subject. So I thought it was a very morbid subject. The hell with it. <laughs> we go to the crematorium. Harry and Spike and I are feeling dreadful. Awful, it's an awful day and the clouds are lowering and it's black and the darkness at noon and it's a dreadful feeling. And a nice man, the Reverend Hester, an awfully nice man. He was a great friend of all of us. He's been a clergyman we've all known. And suddenly he came to the committal, and we're really feeling very, very bad about the whole thing. And uh, it's sort of dawning on us what's happened, really. It was a bit of a, sh a shock, obviously. And suddenly he said, and now we're going to play a piece of music for the committal that is something that must have meant a great deal to Peter. And I went, <laughs> God, they're not going to play it. And Harry didn't know, and Spike didn't know at that moment. And they were looking with interest to see what this piece of music was, a hallelujah chorus or whatever it was going to be. And he said, and so as it meant a lot to Peter, it should mean a lot to us. Because he's a nice man, you see, and Peter had conned him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as Peter did to all of us, because he's got this diabolic sense of, sense of humor. And then he committed the body, you see, and the coffin starts away, and I know what's going to happen. And there it goes. <laughs> I thought, oh, God, that's what it's all about. God bless you, Peter Sellers. <laughs> marvellous. Yeah, absolutely marvellous. Wonderful. I mean, as far as I'm aware, I've never, I've never consciously learnt or, from anyone or, or consciously copied anyone, as it were. It's all just drifted into the, into the subconscious. And mainly, I suppose, Peter Sellers, undoubtedly, in terms of film. I think John Cleese is still the funniest man in Britain. Oh. My favourite gag in the whole of Forty Towers is when he has been down to town to get the duck and he finally comes back and takes the thing off, you know, and there's all the business with he realises there's a great big pink blancmange there, so he puts the cover back on and he looks for where the duck might be, then he looks back in and then finally he puts his, you know... And he... <laughs> No, but, no, no, of course. Let, well, let's talk then. You introduced it earlier than I anticipated by the Baza Foley, but let's talk about that. Because um, uh, that's, he was observed, was he not? I mean, Foley... He did exist. He, he, he did exist. He was I alive. I not say his well. name. No, but to but tell he, me in what circumstance you discovered him. We were filming for Python, which must have been about 71, and we all moved into a hotel called the Glen Eagles down in Torquay, which is now run by disappointingly charming and efficient <laughs> and courteous... <laughs> And we went there, and to my disappointment, <laughs> this, this um, perfect hotelier gave us a, a wonderful time, and I was deeply disappointed because I actually wanted John Howard Davis to see the real object. Yes. The only real difference between him and Basil is that he was small and had a very large henpecking wife. And uh, obviously, we couldn't find anyone much bigger than me, so we decided to reverse, <laughs> reverse that. But otherwise, I mean, he, he was just wonderfully bad-tempered. I went up to the desk the first day and said... Um, Excuse me. And he's one of those people who doesn't look up. You know, you stand yes. at the desk and just keep... <laughs> And it goes on for... You think, did he hear me? And then you say, excuse me. Say, yes. <laughs> so could you, could you possibly um, call me a taxi? What? <laughs> could you call me a taxi? Call you a taxi? <sighs> yes, right. <laughs> He was wonderful. All the other Pythons moved out of the hotel and went to stay at the Imperial. I stayed on. He, he, he also rebuked Terry Gilliam for his table manners, because Terry, being American, cuts the food up, puts the knife there, fork in the right hand, and eats. He went past him and he said, you don't eat like that. <laughs> and he also, had, he also had real madness in him, apart from rudeness, because Eric Idle left his briefcase by the door one morning we waited to be picked up by a car and, and, and uh, he forgot the briefcase. He went off to film and came back and, and Eric said to the guy, uh, I left a briefcase by the... He said, what? <laughs> oh, yes, it's, it's behind the wall. And pointed out at the front door, you see. And there was a swimming pool and a big white wall behind it. And Eric said, but behind the... What? 
He said, behind the, the white wall? Uh, yes, you're behind the wall, behind the wall. Eric <laughs> said, well, where, what? He said, may I ask what? <laughs> Why is it behind the wall? He said, um, I thought there might be a bomb in it. <laughs> and Eric said, a bomb? Because this was all pre-IRA and everything. And he said, well, we've had a lot of staff problems recently. <laughs> Very silent, please, for the father of the bride. Delightful, charming, witty, responsible, wealthy, let's not deny it. Well placed, good looking, and fertile, young man. <laughs> Than Martin as her husband. And I therefore ask the question, why the hell did she marry? They are quite simply the most intolerable herd of steaming social animals I've ever had the misfortune of turning my nose into. I spurn you as I would spurn a rabid dog. I would like to propose a toast to the caterers. <laughs> The method school. It looks like Jeffrey Howe. Now come on. <laughs> come on. Passion. No. <laughs> well, give me something to work well, with. Well, I'll say dr get drunk drama then. I just yeah. can't do that. It makes me embarrassed. No, get too drunk. I can't. I can't. Go on. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I won't ask you to do humility because there's no chance of that. <laughs> Take the ribbon from your hair. All right, all right. You've no. got my skin. Never mind your skin. <laughs> get up. Now get up. What are you doing playing White Christmas? <laughs> Sorry. That's a cock up, in it? Well, it sounded like it. Ladies and gentlemen, help me make it through the night with no cock up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I shall play this classic. Right. Pierce him more, pierce him more. I haven't done No, 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 pierce him more. <laughs> Take the river on your head. Check it. You came in a bit early, though, didn't you? <laughs> what do you mean I came in early? Tommy, when I wanted to come in, yeah. Blooch. What? When I want you to come in, I'll go like this. What? <laughs> You'll nod me in. Right. I'll watch for you nod. <laughs> get back! Get back! You start that, Tommy! You, to you nodded me in! No, that was a piano nod. <laughs> when I want you to come in, I'll go like this. <laughs> so you'll not be it. Yeah. Take the ribbon off oh, your... I'll kill you! Relax, relax! relax. <laughs> if I get an up, Luke. <laughs> when I want it to come in, mm. I'll go like this. <laughs> <laughs> Do it so I can see it. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take the ribbon from your hair. Shake it loose and let it fall. Lay it soft against my skin. Like the shadows on the wall. Come and lay down by my side. Till the early morning light All I'm taking is your time Help me make it through the night I don't care if I don't
Joe, sit out front. <laughs> Yesterday is dead and gone. <laughs> and tomorrow is out of sight. Oh, it's sad to be alone. You talk, you talk. <laughs> Help me make it through the night. Do you have a joke to say, Mr. Bedford? Happy, sir. Just a little, little. Yes, yes. Now I know you drive. I know you drive, and you, you, you love expensive cars. And then, but this man had his, had his brand-new Jaguar. Beautiful car, driving up the M1. <clears throat> he's, doing, he's just keeping it, you know, 69 miles an hour, like Jag drivers do. And he's got... Um, <laughs> happened to look in his mirror, and he sees a chicken running alongside him. <laughs> not a mess. A chicken. A three-legged chicken. A three-legged chicken. <laughs> Oh, put his foot down and gets it up to about 90. Says, that'll, fix the, that'll fix him. cock a doodle do. <laughs> no, the chicken's still there. <laughs> Suddenly, the chicken puts its right wing out and overtakes him. <laughs> and they're doing about 150 miles an hour at the M1. Him in the jack, the chicken ahead. <laughs> He's not catching. Come on, you little beggar. Come here. <laughs> Suddenly, the chicken puts his left wing out up a slip road. He said, I'm like, I'm after it. So he chased it up the slip road, down all these little country lanes. Suddenly, the chicken put his right wing out again and shot into a farmyard. He said, I'm after it. Into the farmyard, pulled up, no sound of the chicken. No sound of the chicken, just an old farmer crossing the farmyard, as farmers do. I don't know why they walk like this. There must be a reason. But I'm not reason. So I said, where is it? He said, what? Where's the chicken? Oh, he said, you chased her? Yes, he said, I chased a three-legged chicken. And he, oh, yes. The farmer says, who oh, are? Who are? He said, I, I breed them. <laughs> he said, you breed three-legged chicken? Yes, he said, I breed three-legged chicken. He said, why? Well, he said, the farmer said, well, I like a leg. <laughs> he said, the wife, she likes a leg. And the son, he likes a leg. <laughs> so I said, what do they taste like? He said, I don't know, I've never caught one. <laughs> I think entertaining is fun. When you hear a, an audience laugh, it's therapy for me and therapy for the audience. I, I, I enjoy it. And you get a great kick out of success. And that goes for every, any, any business you're in, for your business. How could you gather this group, this group of stars tonight? You know, at this money. 